Welcome aboard, Chris Atkins, and thanks for taking time away from your layout and family for chatting with me at Motoro Techniques today. Hey, how's it going? So you can be found on, you've got a lovely Facebook page, uh, it's HO Scale Sheridan and Everywhere West, and I've got, I will link everything to that below, and also any emails and other websites that uh, that we talk about, all links below. So now, Chris, I always like to have a chat with people about how they got into the hobby and sort of what their interests and all that are. So is there a sort of, can you sort of tell us what your background of the hobby is and how you sort of got into it? I uh, started, you know, as a lot of people with a, a gift uh, of a train set when I was, you know, about five years old. And uh, it was a in scale model railroad out of a Sears catalog or something. And, you know, and then I progressed from there to uh, HO scale on the floor. And then eventually I had the Tyco and Bachman trains on a four bay eight table about two feet off the ground. And, and, um, you know, uh, in uh, about middle school, I got very interested in Colorado Narrow Gauge. And um, I, uh, you know, had the fortune to be able to go to Caboose Hobbies in Denver from time to time. And yeah, nice. See all, the, see all the great Narrow Gauge uh, models available and, and read the uh, Narrow Gauge Gazette. And then going back and forth across Colorado, we would dr- actually go through a lot of the country, um, like Silver Plume, Colorado, which I was just in love with. Um, and, uh, that really set the bug and always wanted to have a big O in three layout. And I got away from model railroading like a lot of people do. And, um, kind of s- always wanted to get back and always liked the idea of the big trestles and mountains and so forth. And when I was in college, I kind of was still kind of dabbling and kind of just trying to pay attention to some railroad history and whatnot. And I discovered uh, a railroad in northern Idaho, close to where I went to college, that uh, had all of the magic of narrow gauge but was a standard gauge railroad called the Camas Prairie. And I absolutely just uh, fell in love with Camas Prairie, and I actually tried building a a small Camas Prairie layout in college and then kind of continued that uh, afterwards. And then um, when we moved to Texas in 2000, um, after I'd gotten married and we had started a family and everything, I uh, decided I really want to build a railroad and kind of went, you know, gung ho gang busters. Yeah, nice. uh, and, uh, so that was kind of the beginning of, uh, really seriously getting into model railroading, you know, I built a layout in my home, uh, living room, uh, just a switching layout. Cause we didn't really have the space. A lot of people know there are no basements in Texas. A typical model road in Texas is in a, you know, maybe a two car garage or some people force enough to have a room sure. above a two car garage or something like that. But, um, anyway, so, uh, did the Camus Prairie stuff and then, um, participated in a club for quite a while. And then, um, uh, six, six or seven years ago, we were fortunate enough to, um, be able to purchase a piece of property that had a dedicated building on it, something that we were looking for at the time. Yeah, nice. And I've, to, I've told this story before, but a lot of people um, you know, might not know that, uh, yeah, so the layout, I, the space I have now is in a um, building that was moved onto the property in about 1999, specifically to be a model railroad building. And it was, it was purchased um, by a, a friend of mine, a model railroad friend of mine named Shane Murphy. It was purchased. Yeah, sure. um, to be his his train building, and uh, it's kind of interesting because it was originally built by the railroad and used uh, by the railroad as um, a bunkhouse for the section crews, sometimes known as the section house. And so um, he had a model railroad in here until I guess about eight years ago, and uh, I used to come out and help him uh, work on it, and um, we would operate on it and so forth, and. I just kind of randomly ran into him and said, hey, we might be your neighbor. We've been looking for some property out by you. And he says, oh, that place is gone. I'm moving to East Texas. And I said, really? He said, I said well, what, what happened to the building? And he goes, oh, it's, it's, on the, it's still there. The layout's gone. Um, but uh, he had basically ripped the layout out in about two weeks, 
Wow. Uh, because it, it had only been about two weeks since I'd seen him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, layout was gone and the place was for sale. And we just, you know, we talked about it and came up with the price. And uh, um, seven years ago, I, we uh, started building a house here. Sure. Six, six and a half years ago, I guess. We moved in in July, started in January. So, so anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been uh, pretty cool. And so that kind of started the next adventure in my uh, model road hobby space. A lot of people don't have the space, and so it's uh, it's, it's been very fortunate. Yeah. Your Texans are not too dissimilar to what we've got here in Australia as well. We don't have a basement. We don't build our houses as such. It's like it's always an outbuilding, mm-hmm. um, whether it's a bit like yours um, or it's a, a barn style or we call it we call them sheds here in Australia, which is sort of corrugated iron, which we need to line and air, air condition and sort of temperature control a little bit, and that's what I've got. So I'm very lucky. Uh, I've got a, a 30 by 30 foot uh, or 10 by 10 in my my neck of the woods sort of <laughs> section of my shed um, to do to do my my modelling as well. So I, it's, a, it's a rather large space, and it gets rather daunting at times, thinking how the hell am I ever going to finish this thing, but you eat. Plug along, don't we? So we plug along, which is great. So now, influences. Who you, you sort of touched on Owen 30, sort of that sort of Colorado sort of sort of Mark, Malcolm Fellow sort of an influence were you early on, or who would be your, your modeling guru? Yeah, you that- know, uh, Malcolm Furlow and John Olson were huge influences to me when I was, you know, in that era, the 12, 13 years old, and read a model router, and they were very – very, um, very well featured. You know, first sure. John Olson with his, uh, his, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, I just drew a blank. He had a four by eight model railroad that he f- was featured in there. Um, Jerome and Southwestern, and then later Malcolm Furlow with his uh, HON three layout. Sure. And um, and then, you know, also I, I think I mentioned this um, at some point, uh, not not to you, but. Uh, I've brought this up before. Is that um, you know some other model road, some other people in Model Road magazine are a huge influence to me, including um, Andy Sprandio. Sure, um, sure. And uh, I remember reading the art, set of articles he did in the mid '80s on um, the uh, Washita and Santa Fe layout. And it was the first time I ever saw um, you know Homosote used like that and and a lot of things were very influential yeah sure. and uh later i got to meet him and got to know him a little bit and uh you know he inf- influenced me a lot of ways operating and stuff too so yeah sure but yeah um you know the my that, those are kind of my guys in that era yeah um just because um they were in the magazines a lot when i was very um you know being kind of coming into the hobby and uh, yeah. i grew up in uh, rural wyoming yeah. Uh, which is uh, the least populated state in the United States. And uh, there are three times as many deer in Wyoming as there are people. <laughs> uh, so needless to say, <laughs> there weren't a lot of model riveters on the corner. Um, I did uh, I did luck into a couple situations. Uh, you know, like an older brother of one of my friends was into Lionel, and he got involved with um, putting together a uh, – like a commemorative model railroad for a small town that was having their centennial. Nice. And so, yeah, and yeah so that was pretty cool. And, um, and interestingly enough, we actually had a hobby shop in this little town that never had more than like 14,000 people in it. Um, you know, just a different <laughs> era. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, I could read, I could, uh, call places up and order things on the phone back then too. So, but, um, you know, the, the magazines, because of that, were very influential. And of course, this is the era before the internet. We might have a quick chat about now on the screen there. This is, we'll start having a chat about your lovely layout. So can you, obviously I've got some photos up there. We can sort of talk about different uh, different aspects of it. And obviously your your passion is the operations side of things. So we might, t- we'll definitely touch on that. So tell us a little bit the size of the layout, sort of its uh, sort of its influence, what what sort of motive power you're running and era and sort of everything in between. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, I mentioned I modeled Canvas Prairie for a long time, which was 1954. And when I got the big space, I wanted 
to do something that was a little more than a branch line. You know, I could have built a great big Camas Prairie layout and we could have run two trains a day. You know, it was just, you know, it would have been pretty fun to build because I would have had a lot of space to build the scenery and whatnot. Sure. But um, so I wanted something that had a little taste of mainline operations, um, partly because I've always been interested in, in signaling and, uh, you know, uh, you did mention the operations because uh, that is my real passion in the hobby sure. is operations, um, having operating sessions, being involved in operating events, things like that. So I started thinking about oh, – and also I guess I should say is that I wanted to stick with uh, at least one of the two railroads that I modeled, which uh, the Camas Prairie was owned by the Northern Pacific and the, and the Union Pacific in that era, and then – so I had been I had become very involved in the Northern Pacific's Historical Association, and so I that was a you know that was necessary to stay involved with that and, and stay with that prototype. So I started looking along the Northern Pacific Main Line, which ran from um, the tr Twin Cities in Minnesota to Seattle, Washington, and to Portland, Oregon, yeah, no. and the areas that most influential to me were in Montana because of its proximity where I grew up right on the Wyoming Montana border sure. and um, so uh, and it became pretty obvious that this area around Billings Montana was probably um, gonna have to be what I modeled yeah. and there's a lot of reasons for that um, I also while I never modeled the Chicago Burlington and Quincy it was the railroad that um, essentially went through my hometown, uh, which, but the, there that I grew up in was Burlington Northern Era, but the 1960s, this would have been the uh, Burlington Route or CB and Q. Sure. And part of that was because uh, I'd become friends with a, with a fellow in um, Houston. So I live in North Texas near Dallas, you know, Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, Houston's about five hours away, you know, big city. Um, there was a fellow down there that was a prolific Burlington author named Mike Spohr. And I'd become friends with Mike Spohr. And he, I rode with him to an operating weekend in Arkansas. And he basically twisted my arm the entire time, <laughs> trying to convince me to model the Burlington. And yeah. so we started talking about options and it became obvious that this connecting up this line from Wyoming, yeah. which was the far west end of the Burlington, um, would uh, would be uh, interesting and, and have some operation uh, whatnot. So that's kind of how I got where I am. So the building, like I said, is a historic building. It was built in 1885 um, and it's I'm sorry, 1895, uh, and it's uh, roughly 80 feet long and just under 16 feet wide on the inside. Wow. So uh, there's a section in the middle, and you're, you've been flipping through some pictures here. Uh, if you can kind of look at the overview one, um, I guess it's maybe it's on an auto scroll. But yeah, uh, if you look, there's a yeah. section there's a section in the middle that's um, you know it's got like a mechanical area in it and a, and a bathroom. I put the bathroom there and. Um, so, so that kind of takes up the middle. So it's not an all usable space, but um, but there is a one continuous wall that's the full eighty uh, plus feet, and um, you know, it's uh, it's a big space. So I haven't uh, I haven't basically tried to do it all at once. I took it in small bites, yeah, and started by thinking, oh, I'll try to work on the upper deck and maybe get some of that built, and then we'll add some lower deck, and then I started. Realizing, oh, if I want to operate this model railroad, which is again kind of the reason I was building it, I got to work on the lower deck. <laughs> so I jumped in and got the lower, big chunk of the lower deck finished, which is the upper deck is mostly the Burlington, which you can think of as rural. A lot of these pictures that were we were showing, um, it's this kind of rural Wyoming where there's nothing for, you know. Yeah. Hundreds of miles. It's not quite the Australian outback, but um, yeah. it's it's not far from it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you could still go there today, and it looks just like it did, yeah. um, you know, sixty years ago. 
or more. Yeah, right. Now I know the so, building, the Billings area. Uh, we a few years ago, a family trip, we actually flew into Billings Airport. Oh, okay. Um, to hire a car yeah. to drive out to Yellowstone National Park. Yeah. So, sure. Very, very yeah, common. Lovely. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. I uh, I love I love talking to people about Yellowstone that are yeah. not from you know Wyoming, obviously. Yeah. Uh, especially people I run into here in Texas because uh, it truly is a treasure, and yeah. uh, I've been there at least forty times in my life. Yeah. Uh, maybe you know maybe not the full vacation every time, but yeah. uh, I've been through there a number of times because. Um, I had family in Idaho and uh, yeah. lived in uh, Wyoming. We, it's kind of, kind of in the middle. <laughs> yeah, we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. Just the, the countryside, as you say, it is very similar to what I'm used to in my part of the neck of the woods, so to speak. But um, we, we it's just one of those drives as well. We, we get out and drive. That's how we do our holidays and sort of experience yeah. like that. And we came across, it was just, oh, how about we go this way? And we ended up on the Bear, Beartooth Highway. I don't know if you're familiar uh-huh. with that. Sure. And that was that's one right. of the most phenomenal drives um, that I can remember of the United yeah. States. It was just gorgeous. And obviously from where we are, we don't have snow in my state anyway. Um, it was obviously get right to the top and there was a little bit of snow for the kids. So that was fantastic. Time, so, yeah. Was it June or July or something? No, we didn't go until later in the year. Um, there wasn't a lot of snow around, but enough to, for us Australians to go, Oh yeah, that's snow. <laughs> was it, oh, was it, was oh, it summer or had it? No, nah, it, it was. Or tend to uh, fall yet? Like um, September? It was September-ish, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, tell me about the snow in Yellowstone in September. Yeah. Well, we actually, we stayed in, um, I think, is it the, the oh, which gate did we go in? Go on. We stayed in like a, a you ranch. Went, you, went, you went in the Northwest Gate if yeah. you took the Bear Highway. Yeah. So we, we stayed in a ranch off there and we actually went horse riding. It actually snowed that day on our horse ride and it was just phenomenal. Yeah. It's just gorgeous country. Yeah. So People that... People from Texas are always surprised to find out it snows in Yellowstone in September. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and June. <laughs> yeah, so we went from landing in te- uh, in Las Vegas being a hundred degrees, um, hundred degrees plus to trans, you know, up to up to up to the north later on in a few weeks' time. It was oh, it was gorgeous. So anyway, we digress, <laughs> but. Yeah. Well, uh, connection there, uh, as you, uh, drive the Beartooth highway to get there, you'd go through Red Lodge, Montana, uh, Red Lodge, not on yep. my model railroad, but it is on the branch line of the Northern Pacific and there were coal yep. mines there and, yeah, nice. uh, it's a neat little town. They still got a depot there and, yep. uh, yeah, I do yep. remember Red Lodge cause it reminded me of Twin Peaks, <laughs> the little township in Twin Peaks, if I remember correctly and had a little, had a lovely little meal there. So, which I think <laughs> I had hot dog cause I needed the, one of the things I wanted to do in the United States was experience the hot dogs so <laughs> montana is known for its hot dogs yeah yeah <laughs> but uh to everyone's disgust i have tomato sauce what we call it here in australia you call it ketchup so and i am over eight years of age so <laughs> 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 but i have i have bacon and onion and chutney and mustard and all sorts on it so it's not just just the sauce so guessing that you never found chutney for hot dogs in montana it's just a hunch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I wasn't there. It was different parts, but so anyway, yeah, that was, yeah, I, I, I have fond memories of that little town and definitely want to get back there. We were meant to go there last year, but obviously this uh, virus hit the world and we couldn't fly anywhere. So here we are. So yeah, I find it, uh, you know, it's always fascinating to find people taking holiday in, in the US. I, I've seen, just about all of the Western U.S., the Eastern U.S. I'm not as familiar with, but uh, um, there's there's definitely um, things here. And we, well, we've my family have now started trying to get out of the U.S. for holidays, yeah. and uh, yeah, we uh, we we missed a trip to England this year to see Peter and everybody yeah, sure. in England. But uh, yeah, uh, Australia is probably going to be a few years. We still have a lot left. <laughs> to yeah. see that it's within less than eight hours from our house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's exactly right. So, and it's anywhere like Australia, you got to travel a long way to get anywhere, you know, because um, we 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 like getting out to the the back blocks as we call it, out bush, I suppose. Um, just sort of say that's where you meet the characters and get out of the the big cities. So, hence why we like the you United know, States. So, you know, uh, interesting is these uh, to connect this with the railroads is these these national parks were all developed by the railroads. Yeah. All of our, you know, not all of them, but the ones, the big ones, the big ones in Montana, especially, yeah. um, 
And, uh, you know, Yellowstone, of course, uh, the north entrance was NP's entrance. The yeah. uh, the west entrance uh, – I'm sorry, earlier I said northwest. I meant northeast. I get my direction yeah, straight. Uh, so the, the west entrance, of course, is the Union Pacific entrance at West Yellowstone. Sure. Uh, the, the east entrance at Cody was the Burlington's entrance. Yeah. And uh, there was actually another one in uh, Lander, the Chicago Burlington – I mean, to the um, – uh, Chicago Northwestern had, uh, yeah. tried, uh, yeah. So that, that, and then, uh, so yeah, Yellowstone was a big railroad, uh, destination. Uh, and then, um, of course the great Northern developed the, um, Glacier National Park, which is also just spectacular and, yeah, uh, sure. worth seeing. And, uh, I, uh, I went, you know, and then you get like, uh, places like in Idaho where the, um, Union Pacific developed a ski resort, uh, to try to generate, um, uh, traffic or traffic for, uh, you know, this is in the depression too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sun Valley was, uh, was built like in the mid thirties, uh, yeah. and, and tried to generate, uh, passenger traffic. So, yeah, no. yeah. I think so, that, uh, probably in California that there's some connections too. I'm just not familiar with them. Yeah. We, we, we did a little bit of California, obviously more because we went to Disneyland with the young kids. So that's one of the reasons why we ended up over there, but we have, family in eugene oregon so that's we sort of oh, yeah. did, we did more of the west coast so so we had all these lovely train trips and all that um durango silverton Tol, uh, compass toltec and i think there's a few yeah. over in oregon way as well we had we had organized so yep, i definitely want, definitely want to get back over there i've obviously spoken with michelle a few times in um in greeley colorado so i'd love yeah. to get up there and see the offerings at the the museum there definitely so yeah that uh i that narrow gauge those two narrow gauge railroads you mentioned um yeah um and you can oh one of them's in more or less new new mexico, new mexico. slash colorado yeah. but uh the other one colorado yeah so uh yeah i learned um i learned a very important lesson one year on one of our uh big family vacations um that my wife is only good for one train trip per vacation so once i learned that um you know happy wife happy life <laughs> well, i'm i'm, I'm <laughs> very very blessed i must admit like on this trip that we had planned and we will we will get over there and um, we had i think it was four or five we had to go so <laughs> oh nice no we did uh we yeah. did the uh two, the two railroads the two narrow gauge railroads back to back and she yeah. did not have a time on the second one it was just too much no okay yeah. so we were very lucky the last time we i know we're getting away from trains here but we're talking about prototype which is also fun as well so when we were we sort of came into so we're on the west coast coming uh we came out of yosemite national park i think it was and we came literally driving into where our accommodation was about two minutes up the road was the Sugar Pine Railway from the Yosemite. Mm. And that was, so the next day it was running. So, my, you know, so that's another one I got in. So and that was just a gorgeous railway. And I, you know, heard they lost a bit of land and trackage and a, and a rather large fire. The, I think it was the following year, which was 2017, I think, uh, or 18. Mm. So they're everywhere. That's why I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Because we're not, you, we don't have anything like that in Australia. We've got a, um, a tourist railway here in my state of South Australia, and there's we have two in the whole state. So, to give you an idea how big our state is, you know, Texas is rather large, but South Australia is bigger again. So, um, yeah. land mass wise, well, so. Uh, I believe that your one steam train is probably, or your two two tourist trains is maybe one more than we have in Texas. Yeah. Uh, We've kind of played around with two, but mostly we just have the, uh, well, it depends on how you count them. We have some trains that are not steam trains. Yeah, sure. So, anyway. Anyway, so back to the model railroad. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I mentioned I tried to, you know, kind of build it so that I could get it going at some level um, so that I could operate it. And, uh so that was kind of my initial goal. This has been about seven years ago, six years ago. Um, I, I, we had an operating weekend here locally, and I realized, oh, if I'm going to participate in that, I've got to get something built that people can actually uh, operate on. So that was what I concentrated on. So that fall, I actually had um, um, you know enough operating that uh, four people could operate, um, which was uh, – which was pretty good. And so then it's just kind of been growing from there. Um, I'd add 
I'd add on some more and I'd do some other stuff and then uh, maybe, um, you know, some get another person operating or work on the upper deck, which um, is not really set up for operating now. Sure. Uh, but uh, that's kind of where I've also done any scenery that I've done is on the yeah, upper deck. Yeah, nice. So, so what sort of uh, mainline running sort of footage wise are we looking at? Uh, that's a good question. I had that no, those numbers. Um, if I'd known there was a quiz, I could have prepared. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, I have. Let me see if I can find a. Uh, I may not have it, but, uh, you know, so let's think about it. We can add it up as we go. So if we just look at one deck, the length of the building is 85 feet. And then you kind of come around another 15 feet. And then you go, well, let's say 35 feet. And then you come back 35 feet. So we're at, um, what, you know, Let's just add that up. So 85 and it's about 135. Feet. Yeah. And then, uh, um, and then, uh, really you do that 35 thing. Well, actually, and then multiply that. So 155 times two. And, uh, and then, so which is 310. And then you, it's two decks. So it's roughly 600 That's feet, okay. I think. Yeah. Uh, that and that's uh, you know a big chunk of the, the bottom deck is double de uh, double track right double track. yeah uh, which is uh, following the prototype uh, through sure. Billings Montana yeah and then the upper deck is mostly single tracked which is the Burlington through Wyoming yeah lovely 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 so so um, obviously DCC so what sort of system you got running there and so uh, when I was in the club, uh, the Southside Railroad Modelers in Dallas, uh, we were a big Digitrax club. A uh, big part of that is because um, Alan Gardner, mm -hmm. a lot of people may know, yeah. who does the wiring for DCC website. Yeah. Yeah. He was a member of our club, and he's a big Digitrax guy. So I, I've been, uh, you know, kind of using nothing but Digitrax for yeah, sure. uh, tw twenty years now, and. Um, you know, I, I but what's interesting is because I operate a lot, I use all the systems, and I and I actually like something about just just about all of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, if I were to start over today, I um, I might do NCE instead. I think yeah. a very important rule is to pick whatever DCC system your friends have. Yeah. Because having a support network for yeah. your DCC system okay. is more important than, than any. Feature that they have. Yeah, agreed. I um, personally run um, I run European steam trains, so uh -huh. um, I've got a Roco Z twenty one. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but you know that, that's people in my I know area. Roco. Yeah, you know. yeah, that's what they run as well. So I think, you're uh, exactly right. Do they have like a a big dial on it for the knob? Yeah, they got like a the big Z central dial, and it's sort of an ergonomic yeah. sort of sort of handpiece. I've never I've never actually used one, but I've seen I've seen them in pictures. Yeah. So no, no, I yeah, quite like them. So they do do what I need them to do. So now, JMRI, I'm assuming, because I reckon I've seen some photos scroll up here of JMRI. So you're obviously into to that for your operations as well. Yeah. So one of the things I have um, kind of gone down the path of is I don't have any toggle switches on my fascia for the lower deck. Everything is accessory decoders and. Yep. How I throw the switches is JMRI, and I just have these uh, cheap Kindle Fire tablets on the sure. mounted on the fascia, and you just touch it to throw the switch. Um, and uh, I, I I like it. Uh, you know, it's a lot of work to install the accessory decoders, but um, yeah, a lot of times yeah. it's it's worth it. And the operators seem to take to it pretty well. Yeah. I know what I'm doing in the upper deck in order to differentiate it is I'm I'm putting rotary switches in. With the Rick's um, CTC um, panel thingies and Fages, um, yep. yeah, little fascia things, and uh, that seems to be pretty pretty neat. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah, sure. If I can find enough rotary switches, they're kind of hard to find. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. No. Um. I'm very much. I don't have any hard. What I would call hard wired control panels. I run. A program called Train Controller, which is not too dissimilar to JMRI, I suppose, just mm -hmm. the, the German undertaking yeah. of it, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'm and, like that. 
And so all of mine, same same one as um, Mr. Borch's runs. So I've obviously had a chat with mm-hmm. him about of it. So um, yeah, they're just fantastic. And obviously, I do the same. I don't use tablets. I use what um, uh, old personal computers on, on a Wi-Fi network, and I do it that way. But it's just so much easier, I think. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's a little bit of work doing the decoders, but I think it's a lot less work than trying to wire a control panel in a small place. That's for sure. So been there and done yeah, you that. Know- uh, one of the one of the guys I know that's really into um, you know automation and stuff uh, up in uh, Tulsa, uh, Steve. Um, um, oh, I'm so bad at remembering names when I need to think of him. He'll come to me if I don't. Anyway, so Steve uh, uh, is KCS modeler. Um, <laughs> it's gonna drive me nuts trying to think of it. Anyway, so he he ran a, he had his whole layout set up to run railroad and company. Um, and um he um i steve davis i don't know why i couldn't think of that i'm just if i make myself think of it i won't think of it uh but anyway steve davis had this whole layout set up at real company i liked it i thought it worked real well and then he just decided to go to jmri for some reason yeah okay it's it's very interesting of speed bless his heart he's uh kiboshed me into doing an nmrx clinic coming up in about a month's time or something and that's what i'm going to do mine on on train controller so see how that goes mm. it doesn't seem to have there's a few that are modelers i know within the united states that will use train controller um i think the biggest issue with train controller is its price compared to jmri mm. but i find right. um the actual programming of train controller very very intuitive from my point of view so Apples for apples, I suppose. Uh, it's whatever what people are comfortable with. But um, I think a lot of the stuff that it's really good at, you don't find people in the United States um, trying to do. It just uh, doesn't seem to be as popular as it is in Europe, for no, instance. That's right. They're, they're more rail fanners over in Europe than operators. And I'm a, I'm a little bit in between. I like seeing the trains go around so I can send automatic trains around, but I've set up the scheduling within Train Controller to be able to run trains semi-automatically as well so so that sort of that's that's how i run my operating sessions so so just on operations obviously how you run your operation system so how, how do they look on your railway um or railroad i should say um how many operators how many different jobs we, we're looking at paperwork and the like so well, you know, it's it's completely flexible, right? It's whatever I kind of want to do. Um, yeah, sure. It's been so long since I've operated. Let's see if I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> last time I operated, let's see, we had um, five, six jobs. One, two, three, four. Let's say five jobs. <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> I could do six, but I think five <laughs> is probably what we did. And um, we, uh, you yeah, know, we run pretty pretty typically around here. We run three hour sessions. Yeah. Um, and this was a uh, operating weekend. Actually, I operated two or three times after the operating weekend because it was all you know set up and going, and I wanted to get some locals in and whatnot. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, the sections that I've been operating, uh, I've got a. Um, Billings Yard. Billings is a big industrial town in Montana. It really, it's the largest city in Montana. However, it's not where the big railroad classification, or um, it's not a big railroad town. It's not where the big classification yard is. That's in a town about 16 miles away called Laurel. And but there is a yard there, and that was used primarily to, you know, set up the the work for the the jobs out of Billings. Sure. Um, the, um, so there's two guys that work that job, uh, yard master, assistant yard master. And then I run two crews out of there that actually do the switching areas and I've got them all kind of broken up so that, um, uh, well, it's easy for the yard master to, um, you know, classify the work by, um, by click charts, even though probably click charts weren't used necessarily at that era, but it's uh, because I use um, Shenware, it's very easy for me to set up the click yeah. click 
numbers and whatnot. And so I've built click charts and I have the click charts around and whatnot to help people. Um, and then, um, I, um, have another job. The newer, the newest job is, uh, the sugar factory job, which is, um, was an interesting how it came about. Uh, I always wanted to have a sugar factory. It was always in the plan because that's uh, one of the bigger industries in Billings. And I'm fascinated with the sugar industry, sugar beet industry specifically. And um, the um, sugar factory was going to just be along the side, you know, because the benches are roughly two feet wide generally. Sure. And it was just going to be kind of in – in the track area there where the, you know, the main line I'd already laid, the double track main line was going to go around the back and then there was going to be a sugar factory in between it. And this was on the, the bench opposite of uh, the aisle from the Billings yard. And so, um, I had, um, kind of, you know, like I said, pretty well kind of just decided it was just going to run there and it was going to be limited to that. And, and then uh, a friend of mine, who's a, a big in scale moderator, uh, Dean Ferris, uh, he had, he came over and uh, to help me lay some track or something, and uh, I think he was there for maybe three or four hours and got like two pieces of track laid in the time because we sat there and talked Told. about, uh, <laughs> yeah, mostly we talked about you know yeah. ideas because I just hap- happened to mention that I'd kind of given up on the idea of the um, the way the staging was going to be connected to the big classification yard in Laurel. Yeah, sure. uh, Laurel, if you look at it on a map, there's railroad coming in, obviously from the east and west, because those are the Northern Pacific main line. And then there's a railroad coming down from the um, Great Falls from the north. And then there's the railroad coming up from two directions from Montana, because uh, the railroad came in on both sides of the mountains on the side I'm bottle, which is Sheridan, which would yeah. be on the east side of the mountains. And then also on the west side of the mountains, it came from Casper. And they all ca- they both came into um, the Laurel area. So he kind of had these like five spokes of a wheel, right? Yeah. And, uh, so I was gonna just kind of, kind of fake how the great Northern connection was going to come from great falls. And so he was like, Oh, you can't do that. I'm like, wow, nobody will know because this is <laughs> Texas and you know, people barely even know where Wyoming is, let alone how yeah. the specifics of how this yard was laid out. And he goes, well, I'll know. And so that's, <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, in a way, he's right because uh, the that area up there, uh, of course, the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific and the um, Chicago Burlington Quincy and the uh, Seattle Spokane, um, uh, uh, see, I'm sorry, Seattle Portland Spokane, uh, they all merged in 1970 to create the Burlington Northern, and um, they, uh, you know. Which is which is kind of what this is, and then Montana Rail Link uh, leased this chunk of it in 1988. Well, uh, but there's still this connection to Burlington Northern, which then merged into the Burlington Northern Santa Fe, which yeah. is based right here, you know, like 20 miles from my house in Fort in Fort Worth, Texas, right? Yeah. And uh, Dean works for BNSF, and a lot of people in this area work for the BNSF. So there's a lot of people that know this railroad just because uh, it. It has a history of being part of uh, the BNSF, more or less, although it's yeah, being yeah. leased Montana Rail Link. So, uh, so he was right. There are people who know. So we started coming up with ideas uh, how to solve this uh, staging problem. And so what I came up with was the track that was already in, that was my main line. I was going to just leave there. Okay. And then instead of putting the sugar factory right next to that track, I would put in some staging tracks. Okay. Now again, this is like a section of of uh, bench work that's like thirty five feet long. Okay, two feet wide, and so uh, and then the we, he was like, you know, we were throwing these ideas out. Well, can you go down with staging? And then uh, I started thinking about, well, what if I went up, not with staging, but with the sugar factory? And so I I ultimately wound up raising the sugar factory about eight inches above the staging. And I put in a steel um, bar uh, for my uh, bench work. For the t- you know, basically that was yeah. my and, and I used thread rod, kind of like you might use in a helix or something. Sure. And I kind of got some of this idea watching Mike Rose what he was doing uh, on his Facebook group. Okay, 
And so, um, so a lot of time I've ever used steel for model railroad bench work, but, uh, I kind of liked it. It, it. It's worked out pretty well. And so then what I wound up with was a very, um, what I consider to be a steep ramp that comes up, but it's hidden. It, it starts out hidden underneath the bench work. So you don't see it. And then it, it pops out under a building and which is the sugar factory building itself. Because that was important to me is I didn't want to see this 3% grade, you know, that didn't exist at all. Uh, and I've been happy with it. So, but anyway, that's its own s switching area is a 35 feet long, wow. two feet wide sugar factory. Yeah, so it's got a yard at one end and it, but it's a, but I like this idea of, uh, you know, one big industry that takes one person, three hours to switch. To switch. Sure. Yeah. So, but that, that, and I've been very happy with it and, and it had a lot, you know, and you've, I think I've seen some pictures of it go by, but it has some, uh, some uniqueness, uh, because I needed a lot of number five switches. Yeah. Uh, I ended up, uh, building all of them using fast tracks fixtures. Uh, so there's about, uh, I believe there's 36 switches in the sugar factory. <laughs> How long did it take you to make 36 switches? Well, you know, I didn't make them all at once, right? You make yeah, a few. Sure. You add the track, and then you make some more. I, I've gotten to where I can build a switch. If I build like three or four at a time, yeah. I can build them roughly an hour a piece, maybe a little yeah, bit more. Okay. I've never, I've never got it under an hour. I know a yeah. lot of people say they can build this an hour, but uh, uh, but anyway, uh, I have a much more to build <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, for this uh, classification yard that I've got to work on uh, before long. And uh, but anyway, again, five p five operators, um, three hours. Classification is not really done, but uh, I kind of fake it out uh, there so they have, the yard master has something to do. Mm -hmm. um, so the way it works is there's a staging yard, which represents the big classification yard that hasn't been built yet, which is Laurel. Yeah. And so the trains will come back and forth because that's how it worked is the trains came from Laurel which as transfers, two transfers a day each direction. And then um, that basically fills up the billing yard with all the work that needs to be broke, you know, blocked up to for the jobs sure. and then um then the um you know these uh it kind of the the key is to have some of the work ready to go so that the not everybody's sitting around sitting waiting around, for yeah, the sure. uh, I, I hate this idea of uh the, some operating sessions they have like a it's like gentlemen start your engines right yeah. uh, in other words uh um you know Anyway, so so we we do some things to try to make it so that everybody's uh, got something to do, but it's uh, not everything all the way at once. Uh, the other thing I hate is like when you have an operating session and uh, it's like uh, all the trains come back at the yard at the exact same time at the right at the end of the session. So the uh, yard master sat there with nothing to do until right at the end yeah, when he had right. everything to do and time to go home. And everyone's you know, watching. Sort of everyone's watching them and put them under pressure as well. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so anyway, so I try to do some things like that and I, I, I'm so flexible on these things. I'll try to, you know, I'll just sit here and think of, oh, how do I want to do these operating sessions? And what I have to do two or three of them in a, t in a row that I try to do them the same, but sometimes I'll experiment with things and try different things and whatnot, but, sure. but, uh, enjoy, enjoy that part of it. Um, um, so you touched on before you use Shenware switch, uh, sorry, car cards and waybills. Is that right? I do. Yeah. Yeah. How do you find that? Because that's something I'm using as well, and I don't—I don't believe he's actually in business anymore. Because I've tried emailing him a few times, and it's oh, the website's not I've up heard. there anymore. And it was, oh, it's a lovely program because okay. I've got his um, inventory program as well. So, mm -hmm. which yeah, I—I really I had heard some people were having a hard time getting a hold of him. Yeah, um, I'd hate to see that go away, but um, I have had great success with it. Yeah, um, it's a good program. Um, I. Uh, I think the hardest thing for me is to make double-sided uh, waybills, uh, where the where it's on both sides evenly. That seems to be nearly yeah. impossible. Do you want to see? Uh, I've actually, literally got a template here, literally sitting right next to me. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. How I actually do it? <laughs> All these different measurements and how I got to put it in the printer and well, you're, you're right. Yeah. It just doesn't seem to. So, to so I've it. got it so that it's supposed to work, but what the problem is is that there's enough uh, slop in the printers that Correct. making the pages go exactly the same every time is yeah. impossible. So I got to where I'd like print like 10 or 15 of them at once and yeah. look for the one that was the best, the closest. Yeah. And, yeah. Eh. But then uh, this last batch of uh, waybills uh, I did, 
I completely redid my waybills there a few years ago or a couple of years ago now. And yeah. I just said, yeah, two cycle waybills are fine with me. And yeah, yeah. if I can get the two cycle working well, then maybe we will look at four cycle. But uh, yeah. anyway, but uh, yeah, no, I like it. I, you know, this, uh, he's got, he's got this integration with OPSIG uh, industry database. Yeah, he does. Which yeah. I, I absolutely love. Yeah. And, um, but you said you're you're modeling Europe, right? So that yeah. That well, I'm okay. So I'm more modeling. I'm European stock, ah. but I'm sort of it's in a fictitious world. So I've made my own okay. little world up. So it's it's not not really to a prototype. So, but it's more American. Yeah, the way well, it's run, uh, I suppose. So the reason I mentioned that is, um, you know, I was constantly putting in, you know stuff in my waybills, and I wanted to have industries that I knew were on the Northern Pacific and whatnot. Yeah. And so I had these uh, two paper books of industries and um, I kind of took on a project to, to take the 1968 version of that list and convert it into a digital format that I could pull into Shinware. Sure. Um, so I, I actually did that and the, the files are on the Northern Pacific Railway Historical Association's uh, website. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of like having that, and so I'll go in there and make my own also, so that uh, um, industries that are not on my layout that I know I need to, I have will show up sure. in Shinware. Yeah, that's pretty well what I do. I just it's all as I said, all fictitious, and I make make them all with the, the industries and how they get routed around. And um, I've only run a few operating sessions, so I'm sort of still tweaking it. But I sort of got onto Shinware well, a number of years ago, but there's a I'm trying to think of the chap's name in the United States. He's a Texan as well. Eric Eric Tonk, I think it is, did a few videos. He's got a little in engage layout. I'm pretty sure it's Eric. And um, yeah, so he sort of he color codes the top of the the waybill, which denotes the location that it's going to. So like an area. Um, so I do that bit the same, and it, that works really well. So it's just you know ready reckoner that okay, a yeah. green a green's going to this <clears throat> this certain certain area. So the yeah, art master can just get all the green ones together and it goes off on the train and then use the click system as, as what you've mentioned. Yeah. To so because, to because my big Laurel classification yard hasn't been built, it, it doesn't mean that I didn't um, set it up so that it used Laurel. Yeah. And those green or those bars, those color-coded bars at the top, I have a system also. And, yeah. and that's basically set up so that the uh, Laurel classification jobs can, can tell what railroad um, – yeah. They go out on so you know I, I used it also uh, with my Camas Prairie Railroad because Camas Prairie had um, you would you would uh, classify outbounds and of course there were two uh, just like uh, in a you know a similar manner to this there were two railroads that it could possibly go to yeah, and sure. so I used that there too but yeah no those those uh, color color code system is pretty slick and there's a lot you can do with uh, visual cues like that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So yeah, as I said, I've only run a few operating sessions with it, and I love it. So I, I do it. And then how are you? Uh, how are you for getting operators in your area? Do you have a lot of people interested? Um, not really. Um, there's only there's a sort of few of us. I'm sort of just getting in with a, an operating group that they, well, they operate twice a month. However, I'm a shift worker, so it's very difficult for me to get along to, and these are a retired gentlemen, so they, so it's, everything's in the middle of the day. Um, I'm working, obviously shift work, doing what I'm doing, and then makes it very hard. So I'm, I think the first one I can get to is probably in March area, um, and then he came up the other day, and that's why I laugh so hard about <laughs> when you said about, well, you know, you got your mate that uh, he'll know about any errors that might be in the railway. He, this is my, I got this same bloke. He's exactly the same. He's hilarious. So, <laughs> um, so I work on the three foot rule type top scenario. And if it's he goes, well, I'll know it's not right. And I said, I'm sure you will. <laughs> so we always have, <laughs> a, have a bit of a giggle over it. But um, yeah. So to answer your question, not really. I suppose I'm I'm sort of still sort of running the railway myself to a certain degree to sort of get to it, get it to a point that to see where before I get anyone else to run it, so to speak. So him and this other bloke will run it and get the track Mickey Mouse and everything else that goes along with it. So, but um, I'm looking at getting into to the more the remote operation side of things as well. Um, see how that, where that takes me with the, 
with the cameras and the yeah. and the light. I, don't, but. I know that's very popular. I have not really gotten interested in that, mostly because to me, operating is a very uh, hands-on sw- uh, pick and uh, switch list in one hand and pick in the other hand and the throttle yeah. in the third hand and, you know, yeah. uh, uh, maybe you're running with more than one person or whatever. But uh, to – and I've never really been interested in the kind of operations that, you know, lends itself to remote. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but I mean I don't, I don't have a problem with remote operations. I think yeah, if somebody so. has a – and, you know, and the other thing is my layout is not – scenery wise the point where it has anything visually appealing in it so uh um you know what a lot of people that operate that like the switching aspect operating you know they don't they could care less if there's scenery you know scenery is just stuff that gets in the way and breaks when you know when you're (laughs) (laughs) so uh but but anyway i i i you know i have looked at the what the technology it takes to do the um the cameras and stuff and uh you know that stuff's interesting to me of course because as electrical engineer you know I, I i do get attracted to some of those projects like uh yeah, yeah you know. sure but anyway yeah, i'm only dabbling very very on with it um with martin jenkins and brad and all that that lot mm-hmm. and obviously speed um i've got some cameras and all that set up that i'm playing around with some like the little arduino s s s s esp 32s i'm sort of playing toying around with seeing how they mm-hmm. might work but um you are sort of right you can't sort of switch around with remote operations at this point because the cameras are not such that they're enough de- definition in them um but we'll see how it goes see yeah yeah there's not a good way to remotely uncouple maybe no, when they get that, that figured right. out no that's right at all the best I'd be able to do is someone to run a train across my layout, which I've got a quite a number of passenger trains that could do bridge traffic mm-hmm. and the like, or running a freight from one classification, or sorry, one staging yard to another, or even remote ops, uh, sorry, remote dispatch, I suppose, would be the other way that, that could they could get involved. Um, so, mm-hmm. And that's quite easy with train controller, because um, that's how I run all my, my switchboards anyway. They're all IP addresses or IP... I tap into the system that way. So, thank you for so much for chatting with me on Muddle Railroad Techniques today and getting a bit of an insight into your railway and its locale. And that, that was quite interesting, obviously, because it's parts of the parts of your lovely country that I've visited um, of recent years. So, thank you so much for chatting with me tonight. And hey, no problem. Glad to do it. Make sure you subscribe. Click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. Support us on Patreon. Like us on Facebook and Instagram at Model Railroad Technique.